Hackney in the news. And joining me now to discuss everything from standing with Hillary to that pesky little wage gap, we have on set with me Liz Plank, the executive social editor at Mike, Holly O'Meyerson, a reporter at Fusion, Kathleen Harris, the head of content for Levo League, and joining us via webcam is Sabrina Schaefer, executive director of the Independent Women's Forum. So welcome everyone, good to see you. Uh, and let's just get right to it because spring has sprung, the birds are chirping, the sun is shining, and women are still being paid less than men. Yes, it's that time of year again, equal pay day, when headlines like millennial women are more educated, but still paid less than men, and there still aren't any states where women earn as much as men or in full devastation bloom. So Liz, you right now the wage gap hovers at around 78 cents to the dollar, according to a new report from the AAUW based on Census Bureau data. What do you think? Is the conversation changing or is it just getting louder? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we've heard a lot less about equal pay day this time around than we did last year. Um, which I consider a step back. I know that you know there were a few little announcements this week relating to politics and important stuff happening there. Um, but but usually I feel like we were having a big conversation. There's a lot of thought pieces, a lot of uh, back and forth and, and debates happening and, and politicians talking about it. And now I feel like it sort of went under the radar, which I think is probably bad news, uh, considering that nothing has changed. Uh, if it had been solved uh, in the last 365 days, I guess it would have been fine for us to shove it under the rug. Um, but no, it's it's ridiculous that over the last year, but also over the last decade and 20 years, that this figure has basically remained the same as women have earned way more degrees. And yeah, more I mean, I like what you're saying about the, the idea of the conversation maybe being quieter this year than it has been. Collier, I mean, what do you think? I mean, last year it was, as Liz says, like a, it was a big deal. Right. And I feel like we were hearing about it a lot more. There were lots more people engaged in tweeting about it. Right. Is this to do with apathy, perhaps? I mean, you know, is it just a sort of sense of like, we kind of know it, there's nothing really to do to change it, so we're sort of stuck with it, and that's why? Right. I mean, we were talking about this in the green room. I think there's a lot of energy around um, Hillary announcing, and so it's possible that people are, are putting their stock in her, and that she'll be sort of the, the voice of, of equal pay. Um, so that's that's maybe what, what general consensus is. On this issue. Hillary might be president, we're fine. Right. Uh, <laughs> my, or at least she'll be talking Problem about it. Solved. Yeah. Well, I want to I wanna bring Sabrina because I know you have a slightly different take to this. So, um, you know, what do you, what do you think in terms of the way that equal pay has been at least talked about, first of all, this year? I mean, do you notice a difference this year from last year, for instance? Do you feel like people are talking about it less in general? Well, I do think that they are talking about it less in general, but part of the reason is because last year you'll remember that the president had put forth two executive orders related to pay equity. So that created a lot of sort of media hype and, and discussion. Very yeah, very um, true. But I also think that the reason it's starting to, to lose, the, sort of the bloom is falling off the rose, so to speak, is because more and more people are realizing that this number is, is inflated, that there is a wage gap, but it's much smaller than the 77 cent or the 78 cent statistic that the White House uses. And that I think more people are interested in having a constructive conversation about what women can do to actually better themselves in the workplace. What conversations can we have with our daughters? How can we talk to them about negotiating and making good choices in their life? If salary is the most important thing to them, how can we make sure that we're having a more constructive conversation? And I think that that's actually a very positive step in the right direction. So, you know, I, I sort of take your point with a couple of things in terms of having conversations about how to be more assertive about asking for more money. I think that's a really important part of the conversation. I don't know if I quite agree with you in some of the aspects about women doing things for themselves. I and mean, women should certainly be doing things for themselves, but I do think that there are big faults, aren't there, with the employers? And Kathleen, talk to me a little bit about where you come at this issue. So at Labo, we are the biggest source for millennials in the workplace, the biggest career resource. And to them, they aren't negotiating, which is a huge problem, is we have this massive amount of women entering the workforce. And the fact that they're starting their career paths on an unequal playing field is where you start to see that wage gap just diversify. And I think that, I don't think that the conversation is more quiet this year. I think it's just been a longer going conversation. I think it didn't with Obama uh, raising the issue last year, it really culminated on equal pay day. And a lot of people were talking about it on today. What we've seen is that people have been talking about it all year long. I mean, we had Betty Lou tell us from Bloomberg a story about how her the biggest mistake she ever made, someone told her, was that she didn't negotiate for her first job offer. She took it on the spot. And that's not an uncommon story that we hear all year all year long. Yeah, so we I mean so we yeah. it sort of goes back to what you're talking to. Yeah. They're talking to, right? Right. 
Right. No, absolutely. I remember, you know, asking my brother once we were raised in the same exact environment, told we can do whatever we want. And I asked him about negotiating and he said, of course, every, every job I had. And I kind of laughed because I remember taking you know, my first job for some kittens and not even asking for anything. And I think women do have sort of that reluctance to have any kind of conflict. Um, and, and we go into different fields and this is very important. And this is where I think there can be some agreement. The, the reality is that men and women are different. We have different preferences and aptitudes and strengths. And that's a wonderful thing. It means our a society stronger. We have to make sure that our quest for equality doesn't turn into one for parity. That we have to realize that men and women are going to do different things. Men often do um, different kinds of work where they're by themselves for longer hours. Women want more flexibility. These have trade-offs in, in the marketplace, and that's something that we want to make sure we don't um, uh, discourage. Okay, Claudia, what do you think about this? Well, you know, Ann Friedman, um, a writer, came out with a piece this week in New York Magazine saying that we should actually try to take the responsibility. I mean, I'm all for women doing it for themselves. I think we all are. But the responsibility should really be put on, on employers to release, you know, information about about salaries, you know, uh, pay transparency is something that I, I am a big proponent of. And so I think that that we should be focusing more on on employers and, and getting the government involved in, in those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. You know, one of the things that strikes me is that why this isn't a bipartisan issue. I don't understand why equal pay isn't a bipartisan issue. Uh, you know, Sweden, I want to I read a little bit of an excerpt of a piece you wrote for CNN today. And you, it was uh, Pure Politics, Myth of Equal Pay Day. And in it you write, quote, when we do control for these variables like education, profession, title, a much smaller wage gap persists of about four to six cents, which, uh, some of which may be the result of gender discrimination, but it also is likely the function of women's choices and different behavior, such as not negotiating as often as men do, factors for which economists simply can't control. Uh, now, so I, I grant you that I think that what it sounds like, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like that you are not talking about the fact that a pay gap doesn't exist. You can see that it does, but it comes down to methodology. But then I feel like this comes both ways because I've got a, a map here. This is from State of Women in the States. And if you look at something like West Virginia, for example, it's ranked 51st out of all the states on employment and earnings when it comes to pay equity. And there, women are more likely to earn 65 cents. Uh, so far less than the 78 cents from the Census Bureau data. So, I, you know, I grant you, I think that there are differences across the country when it comes to geography, uh, when it comes to the type of profession, type, sorry, type of industry that women want to get into. But why do you think that this continues to not be an issue that should be one, and can be one, that is bipartisan? Uh, well, I think one of the things is that I'm not sure we're, we're clear on what we're talking about here. I mean, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the 77 cent or 78 cent statistic, is a comparison of averages. It's full-time working women to full-time working men. So if you look at a state like West Virginia, I have to guess, and I am sort of making an assumption here, that a large percentage of the men there may be in industries like coal or other parts of the energy industry, um, which are more dangerous, dirtier jobs that women simply aren't doing. And that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't necessarily need to have women doing everything at 50% of what men are doing. Um, but I think we have to be a little bit more honest about why there is this discrepancy. Okay, so when you look at the jobs that have the largest wage gap, physician is number two, financial planner is in the top five. Three of the top five jobs with the largest wage gap happen to be financial jobs and on Wall Street. So these aren't jobs that, I mean, a physician, it's, you're a doctor, yeah. you know, and I feel like there is implicit gender bias that's happening. There's studies that show a woman and a man have the same exact resume, and, or they, oh, I'm sorry, they're presented with two resumes, and John gets the job instead of Jane, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with their qualifications, meeting the person, it has to do with implicit gender bias. And we have to look well. at the way that, well, that society rewards different jobs. I mean, why? I mean, yeah. I, w I was a lifeguard for five years. The amount of responsibility and skill that I had to have to do that job, I was paid less for, at the, for the city of Montreal, which is a government job, um, than a uh, garbage collector. Yeah. And so, and lifeguards are yeah. very Market. female dominated. Yeah. And so, you could argue that coal mining or working in a factory should be paid more than daycare workers or teachers, but I actually think that raising the next generation of human yeah. beings should actually be paid more. I think that's a really yeah, good point. Well, that's so a, we don't want to let you answer. Determination. 
Right. So it's not about oh, women's sorry, choices. Oh, it's about the way that the market rewards different kinds of jobs and rewards jobs that are more heavily male-dominated more than jobs that are female. Starting dominated. salary for a teacher in New York City is $45,000 yes. as compared to a, a dude going to be a doctor gets paid a billion. You know, I, I think mean, that's, I, I think that's, that's an interesting thing as well because well, then we're talking about the entire bias in jobs as well. So Rina, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, first of all, those are two very different kind of jobs that require different kind of skill sets. But if you do look at physicians, for instance, I think this is actually quite interesting because I, I worry that we keep moving the goalposts. So we see that there are actually more women graduating medical school than men these days, but women are choosing to go into different specialties. So we do see that more women are choosing to go into pediatrics and psychiatry, while more men are choosing to go into surgery. These things that take even more training and they are paid more. Yeah, um, but that's not the end. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Salary is not the end reason that people go into something. And people might go into becoming a pediatrician because they can be a physician, but they also do have more flexibility. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, and I think we want to be careful uh, uh, so not to discourage people from doing what they want. So, I, uh, okay, I think that there are a couple of things here. And obviously, as much as we would want to solve this issue of kind of like a, a partisan divide when it comes to this very important issue, I don't think we're going to be able to do it in the 10 minutes, 11 minutes we've allotted. But we will definitely come back to this, you know, in a bigger conversation. But I think that there are certain factors here that one is I think that everybody on this panel, you know, we're all coming at this from different political advantage, but we all agree that there should be choice for women and we should support women's choices, whatever they may be. That seems to be coming through loud and clear. It also seems to be loud and clear that we all understand and are aware that there are differences in methodology when it comes to calculating the actual wage gap. With some industries, it's going to be more. Depending on where you are in the country, it's also going to be more. I think that what I'm trying to get at, though, is this, this fundamental issue, uh, this sort of more esoteric issue of why we can't all across the aisle, across the political divide, come at this from a vantage that is all men and all women for the same jobs should be paid equally. We want that for our children. Uh, this, to me, seems to be the, the, should be the starting point of a conversation, and then we can talk about the minutia. But then when you don't have that kind of consensus at the beginning, it, it feels like then nothing will ever be done, and then this gap is going to grow marginally smaller every single year, and then we have the same hashed conversations that we've been having. Which I don't think any of us want. Right? All right. I mean, how do we get to a solution if we don't recognize the problem or we don't all agree that the problem exists? And and what, to me, the most frustrating part of of this debate um, is is the the fact that it's not a bipartisan issue, and is the fact that actually, if you look at young women, even though there is a wage gap with millennial women, it's very, very, very small. If you look at unmarried, childless young women. And if conservative, what, what, what happens essentially is that the wage gap between mothers and non-mothers is actually larger than the wage gap between women and men. There is a profound discrimination of mothers in the workplace, and conservatives and, and Republicans and people who say that they're pro-family should be concerned with the wage gap, even more than Democrats. If they want people to keep having babies and for us to keep having vibrant families, they need to talk about what men are doing. Actually, why I, don't men want flexible? Well, let's let's this. Why Serena, something Serena I feel terrible because I don't want you to be kind of like the token conservative here. You're absolutely I'm, I'm, not that. I'm not attacking I, Serena. I'm, 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 you're, I'm you're, sorry. You're I, I hope I just it doesn't come off as a personal attack. I, I just I, I don't understand why we're not on board with this idea. Okay, so yeah, go to, go to, on that idea then, Sabrina. Attack that part. Yeah. No, Elizabeth makes a really important point, and I think it's, it, it is, it's relevant to point out this difference between unmarried women and married women with children. The, the thing is, and I guess this is where I differ, is that you know, I have three kids at home, I also work, and I don't see this as some kind of burden that's been imposed on me by a sexist society. This is a choice I made. I, I've had to change my work arrangements over the years. Sometimes I've been, I was at home, I worked part-time, now I work full-time again. Um, there's different choices that we're making. I, I think we just have to be so careful in the conversation not to suggest that society somehow has been, um, you know, imposed this on me, that instead it's I, actually, so actually, actually, Serena, just to, just to step it, I don't think, yeah. I, I, would, I would say, I don't think anyone thinks that that is a, that's a decision that's imposed upon you. I think that everybody supports the notion of a strong woman wanting to become a mother and wanting to devote the time. What I think is one of the interesting things is that this luxury and the flexibility of being able to go part-time occasionally, come back into the workforce, dip in and out, not everybody has that, certainly, and we haven't even touched upon race here, which I feel like is a gross oversight. Uh, you know, I mean, Kathleen, talk to me about some of the statistics around racial disparity when it comes to the pay gap. Well, as uh, Liz said earlier, you know, the 
statistics that come out these days are the average, but when you do cut it by different minorities with African American women, that, that wage gap is significantly higher. Right. And then on the flip side, with Asian American women, it's smaller. So I think the 78 cents is the average about it. But I, I do want to say I also have three kids. I'm a working mom. And everything you look at when you cut the data, it's if you work less hours than a man, if you have a flexible schedule, your salary is adjusted for, for those days. And if a man was to work four days a week as well, the idea is that the woman and the man should be getting paid the same. It doesn't matter if you work part time, if you work full time, in what capacity you work, it should be equal pay for equal work. Yeah, Colleen, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think ultimately, what I, I think it comes back to what happens in the negotiating room. Um, and over 50% of women nationally um, either feel intimidated by uh, trying to argue for a higher wage or they don't know where they're coming in. And that's, that's what the, where the work is that we need to do. On and the fascinating thing is that that seems to be, from what Sabrina was uh, suggesting and, and from what we've seen, that seems to be a point of bipartisanship. People okay. all agree that you know women need to be educated when it comes to uh, the For kind sure, of battery they come into yeah. uh, and also how much but they're being paid. But I don't think that it's, ne it's necessarily the woman's responsibility to know Absolutely. Things, and that alone, that, that the fixed the wage right. gap. Like exactly. That's not the reason why there's a huge wage gap. But I do think fear for negotiating, yeah. it's a huge part of it. The survey we did with Levo, over 60% of millennial women said they didn't negotiate. And the reasons, it all came down to fear, whether they were afraid the job offer would be taken away from them, um, they didn't really know how to ask, retaliation. And I think that comes down to corporate culture. And we found too, for the women who did actually negotiate, they felt more valued at work. They were a happier employee. They felt that they were contributing to a company they believed in. So it, it really is upon companies to look at this, to create an environment to arm their employees with the tools and the knowledge to negotiate for themselves and to create that really safe space to talk about wage and salary and transparency. I mean, in the digital age now, you can find so much data at your fingertips. You know, you can do the research for BLS statistics. You can go on Glassdoor and find out what people are making at other companies. So yeah. it's easier than ever to do the research. So it's just about companies really creating environments to be able to have these frank Yeah, and I, 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 I do think, I do think that national. doesn't take that away as well. I don't think that a, a company be making this data available, I don't think that diminishes a woman's strength in any way. I think that we're all stronger if there is greater transparency with companies actually providing this kind of data. Uh, and also I think we're going to be all stronger if we can have conversations like this and keep it civil as we have done. Uh, and we have different viewpoints and, and you know, hopefully at some point we'll be able to crash out a solution. Unfortunately, we don't have time. But Sabrina, I know you've got to go, so thank you very much uh, for joining us today on HuffPost Live. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, all right, guys. Well, we nearly solved it, right? <laughs> uh, sort of. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on because on Sunday, the voting gods